When I was at school, I had no interest whatsoever in history. I was more interested in fiddling with wires, as I've said. I didn't really understand the importance of history when I was younger. But if you think about it, if you think about any person who has power today, such as a monarch or a prime minister or whoever, an oligarch, they get their power because of what has happened in history, whether that be this century, last century, or even in dark age British history. That determines who has power in conflicts that have gone on in the past. And if you start to unearth things that contradict the story that people have been told to get those people in power, they're not going to like that. Okay? And just to talk about briefly historians, most historians who work for universities, <clears throat> they have a curriculum and they'll teach the same thing every year. <clears throat> and they have students and they have papers to mark. And they will use library books written about history. Not many of them really go out into the field to try and find evidence of uh, previous history. And Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett, that's their bread and butter. They've been trying to unearth new histories since the late 1970s. Um, Alan Wilson on the right here, he was 80 this year, and Alan has a degree in economics and history. He also did two years of an archaeology degree, but he got called up for national service. And make use of Alan while he's here because he's got more knowledge about history than anyone that I know. He's a mind of information. And Baron Blackett on his left, who's his co-author, let's just say baron has got a very unique mind. Okay, so the two of them together make a very good team. And they have made some incredible discoveries. I only became aware of them in 2010. And that's really because they've not been given a platform for their work because there's certain things that they have discovered that people don't really want out in the open. Now, um, the methods that they use uh, are they're fairly straightforward. So they use, they'll look, consult ancient maps to get place names. Um, they've dug up various artifacts. They use ancient poems uh, that often will give information, uh, ancient British documents. Uh, and they've written, um, they've written nine books so far. So they, they, they're all, the top three here, which we've got on display, these are all pertaining to their King Arthur research, their King Arthur work. The hardback, Artorius Rex discovered, that describes the discovery of Arthur II's um, burial site. And we're going to briefly touch on that. So in this talk today, I'm going to spend half of it just on their work and to explain to you why it's so important. And in the, in the second half, I'm going to explain to you what's happened to them. Because if, you, if you're not aware of this story, I, I, I warn you, this is, it's going to shock you. Okay, uh, the later books, um, the, the, uh, the Trojan War talks about the Trojan War of 650 BC, uh, Moses and the Hieroglyphs, Alan actually has uh, worked out, Alan and Barham, um, how to decipher Etruscan and hieroglyphics. Uh, and th their final book, again, a controversial book, they claim they know where the Ark of the Covenant is, and I'm, I'm going to come on to that. But this is their bread and butter. If you go in their house, which I have done many, many times over the last year and a half, um, they've got these, these genealogy charts of British kings on their walls, huge charts that they've constructed using a whole uh, array of different documents. Um, <clears throat> now, and they, they basically, they, they've charted 80 British kings and, and worked out the genealogies for them from around, I think, 50 AD up to sort of 600 AD. And I don't think there's any other historian produced such detailed genealogy charts of the, of the various British kings in that period. Now, this is an eight-minute video uh, just to try and explain um, some of Alan's work. And, and we've got, I did a series uh, which was um, six hours of DVDs here. It's all been on TV. We're going to probably get these repeated. But this is just a snapshot. It's an eight-minute video just to introduce you to the sort of King Arthur, King Arthur research. Wilson and Blackett started in 1976 trying to find the truth about King Arthur. After 14 years of intensive research, they purchased a church which this research was suggesting was the likely burial site of the legendary king. They excavated that site in 1990 and an artifact was unearthed by a digger. This occurred when Wilson and Blackett were not at the site. The object is a solid electrum cross 
which could have only been made for an important or wealthy person. It has been dated to the period of Arthur, which is prior to 600 AD, and has an inscription which reads, For the soul of Arthur. What are the chances of finding that artefact by coincidence at the very site they claimed could be the King Arthur burial site? You get a line of princes, you get a son of Arthur I, Tathal, then Tythrin the subtle, Tythvalt or Theodosius, Tudrig, Theodric, Myrig, Morris, and then Myrig's son, Arthur II. And so you've got two Arthurs very clearly exhibited. These are not hidden. You'll find them clearly in the manuscript evidences that everybody else uses when they're writing about British history. Right, here on a 1980 Ordnance Survey map, you've got the Monument of Milweir, this Monument of the Soldiers of the Military, on Murray de Gaia, Fortress Mountain. We're going there. Now, in 1983, a mere three years later, we've got an addition to the maps in the form of a motorway, but up on Money de Gaia, here, right, can you focus in? We've lost the Monument de Milvia. So we've gained the motorway and we've lost the most ancient and precious of the monuments. Now this is the Monument of the Soldiers. You, this is it, here. This is it. And you can see the whole of the bloody kingdom from here. Just about, you can't see up the valleys, but you can see the whole bloody kingdom from this point. For Alan Wilson then, this site, taken together with other evidence, pointed to the location of Kaya Karadak here in Maganu. We began with two accounts from the ancient records of the secret burial of a king in a mummified form. We now have ten accounts, most of them from the 6th century AD, contemporary with the death of King Arthur. These accounts actually name the mummified king who was wrapped in a leather bag and brought to this river for burial in a secret cave. His name was Arthur, and he's so named in the manuscripts. And what happens is that Sinultid is sitting at his cave, and the ship arrives, and there are eminent people in this boat that puts out from it, and they've got the body of a dead man, who was really some big guy. They bring it to Ultid, swear him to secrecy, and he buries the corpse in the cave. Now, the cave exists. It's still there. According to the Welsh genealogies, St. Ilted and King Arthur are first cousins. So we've got an account of a secret burial in Glamorgan at the very time that King Arthur, who's the only senior member of the royal clan who goes missing, is recorded as being concealed in his burial. The cave was actually sealed up until about, uh, it was 1886. A man from Cardiff went down there and he got a, a local quarryman and they put a little bit, teeny bits of dynamite in and they, they blew the opening out. Duck your head down. You have to keep down coming in, you know. Come on, duck down. Here is the grave pit. You can see the squared off ends, square that end, squared right on there, very, very straight and square this side, and another square in that end. He was buried in the cave. Later, then, when they got the things ready, they took him out of the cave, put him in the church, you see? Right, which, you, which you at some point bought. You we bought had that. bought the church. Right. Church of Wales had let it go derelict, they didn't want it. We said, you sell it to us? They said, yes. We said, OK, we'll buy it. Right. Of course, it's the oldest church in Europe. It's built in the year, sort of, 50 AD. 50 AD. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> we bought it. But they didn't know <laughs> They didn't know that when you bought it off them. Well, that's uh, not for me to tell them, was it? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want it. Yeah. So, OK, so... You are, are so we now owned it, so we could root about quite free from any hindrance, mm. and we did find a stone. And what did the stone say? It says Rex Artorius Philly Mavricki, which would the King Arthur. Uh, yeah, but it's Electrum, which is seventy-nine percent silver, I believe. Uh, yeah, so we took it to the largest and most reputable uh, company in this sort of business, who do all the work for the oil oil companies and everybody else, and they've got all the assistance. Mm -hmm. Uh, systems there, and they have all the necessary tables and records yeah. uh, historically which show what the mix of uh, various impurities would be yeah. in certain eras. You follow me? Sure. And they tested it for us. And what, tell us what the inscription on the front is. Well, it says, uh, uh, Artorius, and there's this, a man on a horse, you can pick him out in the middle. Oh, in the middle there. That's Arthur. I suppose. Oh, on this, on this on cross this, here, that's, yeah. that's King Arthur. Yeah. Uh, the time is 6.16.
In common with most historians, the two men believe that Arthur was an authentic king of Britain who gave rise to the legends of Camelot, the sword and the stone, Guinevere and the Knights of the Round Table. Laurie Mayer reports. The apparent proof that King Arthur was man, not myth, is kept at the bottom of a garden in Cardiff. This ancient sword-shaped stone inscribed Rex Artorius, King Arthur, comes from what's claimed to be the legendary king's last resting place. The stone is said to have arrived by boat up the Oweni River near Bridge End 1400 years ago. In their lifelong quest for the real King Arthur, amateur historians Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett have put their interpretation on ancient manuscripts. An impeccably authentic manuscript of the year 822 tells of the body of a very important man with a stone being brought up this estuary. According to Wilson and Blackett, this is the very cave where the body was temporarily buried. They point to signs of a square-cut grave hewn by hand from the rock. They claim the local church provides evidence of Arthur's family links with the area. Burial stones they regard as vital clues in their historical detective work. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the stone of Paul, son of Mary, a brother of King Arthur. At Ogmore Castle, just down the road, they cite another stone actually naming a King Arthmail, which they translate as Arthur. Wilson and Blackett have now filled several volumes with their exhaustive fieldwork and research, a mass of evidence from so many sources that even academics find it hard to contradict. This bleak hillside, a thousand feet up, marks the end of their quest. In a church they describe as the Westminster Abbey of the Dark Ages. Wilson and Blackett claim it's cost them their homes, their jobs, and 100,000 pounds to find this spot and say with confidence that here lies... Is King Arthur. Half Britain was waiting to see it on the 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, they scrubbed it. Right. When on the 1 o'clock news, it was widely received, phones were ringing all over the place. It went on at 6 o'clock news, mm -hmm. and a, a Half Britain must have been waiting at 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock, and they, they pulled it. And they showed a piece on Sarah Ferguson squeezing herself into a tiny little aeroplane to have fly, uh, flying lessons right. instead. There we Great. go. Yeah, well, I want to see that. Oh, yeah. Um, what an edifying sight. Uh, bum. Right, so I'm going to list some of their discoveries. And as I say, the, the books are here. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, as I said, the genealogy of 80 British kings. Burial sites of King Arthur I and King Arthur II. They believe that Arthur I is buried in a place called Oldbury. They have carved stones associated with both of those burials. Um, the solid electrum cross that you saw there, which is believed to be King Arthur II's burial cross. Um, Alan has also located the legendary Camelot and several other ancient sites of that era. Um, Alan has also uh, linked the Colburn alphabet, which is an ancient British alphabet, uh, to uh, Middle Eastern alphabets uh, such as Etruscan. And I think at, at this present time, I don't think there's anyone who can actually read it, Etruscan. Alan will tell you more about this, but he believes it's linked to the Colburn alphabet. And you can, that can be translated into Welsh and then English. Okay? But this is something that the academic establishment won't look at. It, uh, they've got their blinkers on with it. Um, now, some of their claims, they claim to know where the Ark of the Covenant is buried at a place called Unisable in Wales. Now, for those who don't know, the Ark of the Covenant is the box which Moses built to house the Ten Commandments in around about 1400, 1350 BC. So Moses went up the mountains, supposedly Mount Sinai. He was given the Ten Commandments by God, um, which were carved on two tablets of stone. Um, an enclosure was then manufactured, which was a, a wooden box gold-plated, and then uh, a solid gold box uh, after that, and then another wooden gold-plated box. This is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I don't think there's many academics, historians, dispute that that box d exists or existed, and it was in King Solomon's temple, I think, up until about 586 BC, at which point it was raided. And there's, there's various, and this is what the film Raiders of the Lost Ark is about. It's probably the most important religious and uh, historical artifact that there is. Uh, but nobody seems to know where it is. Now, there are several scholars who believe it came north after that time um, through, Alan believes, uh, Lemnos and ended up in the British Isles. Okay? 
and Wilson and Blackett claim to have traced it to a place in Wales, and we'll come on, come on, come on to that. Um, they also claim that there's a silver casket containing wood from the cross of Christ concealed in a cave in West Wales in a place called Nevin. And um, obviously I'm not presenting the evidence for this. It's all in their books. Um, they've claimed to have located the burial place of Empress Helen, which was a, who was a 4th century Empress Helen. Um, numerous other treasure sites around South Wales. This is an artist's impression of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, okay. I've got a little video here of Alan um, speaking a couple of years back about the Ark of the Covenant because um, their evidence of it, of it um, coming from the, um, the Near East up to, to the UK, there's various documents that, they've, that they cite this is the, the Ark of the UK, but the, the placement of it in this particular mound, this hill in Wales, is very intriguing to me. Uh, it's all to do with with the stars. I'll let Alan explain this in this next clip. All over South Wales, uh, Glamorgan Gwent, there are huge mounds, mainly on hilltops. Huge earth mounds, I mean really big earth mounds, size this room. Some are small. And my colleague said to me one day, he said, uh, Alex, what's that one up there, you know? And I said, he, he said, a, a bloody, I said, a bloody head. Oh, I said, that's a ferocious warrior. And sometimes a penny drops, doesn't it, you know? The ancient Arabs, Hebrews and Egyptians called the star constellation Hercules a ferocious warrior. And a penny was dropping, and oh boy, because over to the other direction is Tumbalu, the he-goat, Capricorn. And over the other way we had a very great boat ship on the top of the hill, and that was spot on for the great constellation of Argo. Now, if you've got two or three stars, you can triangulate and find a pole star. Am I right? So we did, and it's a, it's a, it's a standing stone. And from there, we found all these big mounds. They're all named and located for stars, the major stars in the heavens. So you've got a star map on the ground. They go on about the Nazca drawings, don't they, in Peru? We've got something better and bigger. Just outside Cardiff on the, on the Garth Mountain, there's two big ones and one little one. <laughs> it's right for the belt of Orion, down in Morgan Snow below, big one in the woods. And you can find the four outlying stars of Orion. Come across the way in Cardiff, houses built all around it. Taurus, big mound. Another one on the other side of Cardiff, on top of the hill. Aries are and you're on the Capricorn. And they're everywhere. And that's how you get after the Ark. All you've got to do is find Regulus which is the biggest of the lot. Uh, you see, we said Regulus, because uh, Regulus the star, is the star in, biggest star in Leo, the lion. And Leo the lion is the emblem of Judea and Jerusalem. So we thought there's a good chance that that's it. So it is suggested that the large earth mounds found all over South Wales were laid out by the ancients in a pattern to specifically represent first magnitude stars of various constellations. Wilson and Blackett have produced many star mound maps which confirms this theory. The mound which represents the star Regulus turns out to be at a place called Unus Abul. Just outside this village is a prominent hill or mound. According to Alan, the top section of this mound is man-made. Is this where the Ark of the Covenant is? Yes. In our, in our opinion, yes, yes, and I'll tell you why. It's a man-made mound, about four acres of it, 60 feet high, all man-made, on top of another hill. Someone in antiquity built a stone wall around the top. Right? There are four sumps on the north side, like big hollows in the ground. 